Welcome to First Federated Church's online video podcast of this week's sermon. First Federated Church is based out of Des Moines, Iowa. Please visit www.firstfederated.org for more information. As you know, we're, uh, we're traveling the way of the cross right now on our Sunday morning uh, teaching time, and we're moving toward that Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday celebration. Our focus in this series is on the freedom that the cross affords. We're not looking into all the details of the Passion Week and the crucifixion. Most of us are very familiar with his betrayal and trials and beatings and such like that. But we're looking at this concept of the freedom that the cross affords. Last week, as we looked at the way of the cross, we discovered that it is the way of divine sacrifice. Divine sacrifice is the cost for freedom from sin's condemnation and curse. We looked into the upper room when Jesus met with his disciples for that last Passover that they would celebrate and how he repurposed the Passover and he began to put the focus upon himself and he presented to them as the word presents to us that his body would be broken and his blood shed so that the door to human redemption could be opened. And this is where I begin today, where we left off last Sunday. I want you to catch this this morning and, and, and just uh, think about it for a moment, that when Jesus gave his life on the cross, and I'm so glad that he did, his sacrifice paid the debt for sin. But at that moment, that payment was not applied to anyone specifically. He paid the debt, but that payment was not applied to anyone at that moment specifically. I want you to think of it like this. Before the cross, before Jesus went there, the door to redemption was closed. No one could walk through. No one could obtain right standing with God because What was necessary for that right standing had not yet been taken care of. But through the cross, through the cross, Jesus opened redemption's door. And now it is open. And forgiveness and entry and right standing with God are possible. And so because of the divine sacrifice of the cross, the way has been made, the door has been opened for a people from every nation, tribe, and tongue to come through. But the question today is, when they do, when people do go through that open door, how is the divine sacrifice of Jesus applied to their life? Does Jesus, or does God, Simply wave a magic wand, absolving the repentant sinner of their guilt and condemnation. How does it work? That's the topic for today. I invite you to take your Bibles or your device with the Bible app on it and turn to Romans chapter 6. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 7 as we begin the process today of considering the way of union with Christ's death, that which sets us free. Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin may be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. 
For one who has died has been set free from sin. Father, I pray that in these few moments we have to gather in your word, that your Holy Spirit will minister to us by opening our hearts and minds to the truth that is so clearly proclaimed in your word. Help us to grasp it. Help us to apply it. Help us to see what you have done and what you are doing and how you are working to really make our lives different, to change us and transform us, and to bring what you made available through your suffering on the cross and the glory of your resurrection into our lives and that it is to manifest itself in and through us. May we be encouraged today by the things that we see. And Lord, for those who may be in the audience who have yet to trust Jesus, may today be the day that your word pierces their heart and they see their need and they turn in faith to trust the one who gave his life and rose from the dead for our redemption. May you be honored and glorified, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you wear glasses like I did for over 40 years, and you see me wearing them right now, they're just readers. By the miracle of surgery, I can now see 2020 at a distance, but my old age is causing me to have to still read uh, through readers, right? But if you, wore, if you wear glasses like I did for, uh, for over 40 years, then you know how your glasses can get smudged. And when they get smudged and dirty, it can distort your vision. It can make what you're looking at seem unclear. And I want to say that I believe that's where many of us are spiritually when it comes to the issue of salvation's grace and the freedom that it brings. We, I think many of us are a bit unclear. You know, I grew up in a uh, Bible teaching, gospel believing church. I heard the gospel repeatedly. I understood then as I do now The divine sacrifice was the cost, is the cost, of freedom from sin's condemnation. But back then, my vision about all of this was somewhat distorted about about how that freedom was actually applied to my life. I don't know what I was thinking as I thought back. I've tried to, 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 to see what was I thinking? What was the processes of my mind as it relates to this? And I think I just assumed that, that when I repented and believed that God just kind of waved a magic wand over me and that my guilt and condemnation then just disappeared. That is until maybe I sinned again and then I had to find a way, I thought, to make God happy with me, and so I would work hard to make things right with him. You may shake your head at that and say, oh, I pity you, Pastor Mike, or snicker and think, how foolish was your thinking? And I agree. But you know, I I contend that until we understand what really happens in this matter of the application of the cross to our lives, then we are left with all kinds of scenarios that are less than accurate and lead to all kinds of spiritual problems in our lives. And that's why I'm so grateful this morning that the Holy Spirit of God inspired the Apostle Paul to help us understand it better. It's my prayer today that he will help us walk away from this session session with a clearer understanding of how the cross brings the freedom that Jesus purchased into our lives. Now God's word makes it abundantly clear to anyone who will read it and understand it. That God doesn't wave a magic wand to deal with sin's impact on our lives. Instead, mark this down, what he does is he takes the repentant sinner to the cross and crucifies him or her with Jesus. No magic wands, but the repentant sinner is taken to the cross and is crucified there with Christ. Galatians 2.20, the Apostle Paul says this, I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I 
no longer live. Some of us will hear that and think that's just a metaphor. But I guarantee you it is no metaphor, it is a reality. If our faith is in Jesus, if we have come to him, looking to him alone for our redemption and our salvation, then in a very real way, we become crucified with Jesus. The passage that we've just read from in Romans chapter 6 Specifically, verses 3 through 4 speak to this reality. Let's look at it again. Paul says, do you not know? In other words, we should know. We need to know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Church, God wants us to know how salvation's grace is applied. And so he pulls back the curtain of the physical realm so that Paul can see into the spirit realm to witness what God is doing to redeem a people for himself. And he tells us through Paul That the means by which sin's condemnation is removed from our lives is through union with Jesus in his death for sin. It's clearly there in the passage. In other words, what we need to understand is that just as Jesus went to the cross to die for sin, repenting sinners are taken to the cross to die to sin's condemnation and power. You say, Pastor Mike, I, um, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I know that salvation's grace has covered my life, but I don't remember being nailed to the cross. Neither do I. Because this, this act of God is not a physical one, but is a spiritual one. Now, the temptation for us is this. We are tempted to think that if, if it's not physically experienced, then it's not real, that it's just a symbol or an illustration or a, or a metaphor. So I tell us today that we must fight against that temptation and we must grasp that our spiritual union with Jesus is ever much as real as any physical union could be. But the question is, how does this union in the cross of Christ take place? Paul tells us, It is through baptism. Now, I want to talk about baptism for a few moments. And I'm fearful at the moment that your minds may be going in directions I don't want your minds to go in. But I'll just have to have faith for a few moments that you'll continue to listen and it'll all clear up in a few minutes. Let's talk about the English word baptize or baptism. Uh, by many accounts, it is said that the word we have in English is really just a made-up word. Um, It's a transliteration from the Greek word. And, And that the English language really has no natural word to describe the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo comes from the, um, the industry of cloth dyeing back in the day. The word describes what takes place when cloth is, uh, is changed from one color to another. And the word baptizo means this. I've put a place for you to write this down on your note guide. It means to envelop, to completely cover, to saturate through and through so that... Uh, In so doing, a cloth's identity is forever changed from one color to another. And that brings us then to the question this morning, how does, for example, white cloth get changed to red cloth? 
And I thought today, instead of just describing it to you verbally, I'd give you a little illustration. I'm praying that it'll work. I'm praying that I'll get through this and it'll all make sense. But we'll find out here in just a moment now, won't we? Because the moment of truth has just arrived. How does this change? Well, back in the day, you know, in the Bible, it talks about a woman named Lydia. She was a woman who was engaged in the industry of dyeing cloth to purple. But they would take uh, the cloth, like this white one, right? And the word is baptizo. We've called it baptism or baptize. And that's what would be done. The cloth would be baptized into the dye. And this is red dye here. And when that cloth was submerged into the dye, then every fiber, every part of it would be completely covered, totally uh, enveloped. And not only that, but then the liquid would go into the fiber and literally infuse every fiber of the cloth. So that ultimately, what happens is, is that the cloth is changed. It is changed from the color that it was, and it takes on a brand new identity. It's not the same anymore. It's no longer white cloth, but it is now, in this particular case, I could have gotten it a little darker. I was just trying to avoid pink. But now it is red. And this cloth now is, is red, not like if you painted it. You know, when you paint something, you just layer a color on top of something else. And so visually it looks different. But in reality, it has not become different. You can cut into a wall, for example, that's been painted many times. And with uh, the right magnification, you can see the various layers because all that paint does is whitewash or just cover, okay? If you find a piece that's uh, loose, you can pick it off. and You can clearly see what's underneath it. But when you take something like a cloth and you baptize it, you can cut a cross section of this and it's still red in the center. It's red on the outside, it's red on the inside, it's red on the front, on the back, to the left, to the right. There is no place in which this cloth isn't red now because it has been baptized. It has been completely enveloped, covered, and infused with that in which it has been baptized. And when something is baptized, like this cloth, its identity is irrevocably changed. It is no longer what it was, but it is something brand new. Now I share that with you this morning because this is what God wants us to understand about how the redemption that Jesus purchased on the cross is applied to us. It's not just a covering. It's not just an external change. But it is something that infuses every part of us and irrevocably changes who we are. Now, I need to change lanes here for just a moment to define the different types of baptism because most likely where your minds are going is to water baptism. Now there's no water in that tank right now, but there will be next week because we're going to be baptizing four to five individuals. But invariably when we talk in a Christian church about baptism, everybody goes to water baptism. It's the thing we've seen hundreds of times. It's the thing we're most familiar with. But I need to explain to you this morning, there's another kind of baptism other than water baptism. And it is the subject of the passages we're reading. 
It's called spirit baptism. Spirit baptism. Spirit baptism is an act of the Holy Spirit whereby he baptizes the repentant sinner into Jesus. This spirit baptism is what Paul is talking about in Romans 6. He's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about spirit baptism. He said, Pastor Mike, how do you know that? Well, all we have to do is go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and see what he says there in verses 12 and 13. The context is is, is, is basically the same. Notice what he says in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning with verse 12. The human body has many parts, he says, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been, notice, we've all been baptized into one body by what one spirit and we all share the same spirit what we find here is that the collection of those who follow Jesus are called the body of Christ and Paul says that we become part of the body of Christ through Holy Spirit baptism the Holy Spirit baptizes us. He immerses us into Christ so that Christ fully surrounds and envelops us and that every part of our spirit and soul are permeated with Christ so that just like the white cloth becomes permanently changed into red cloth through baptism so the repenting sinner becomes permanently changed from living under the condemnation of God because of sin to right standing with God in the righteousness of Christ by being baptized into Christ. And I want you to take a look with me again at Romans 6, 3, and 4. And when we look at that passage, we find that our baptism into Christ includes a union with Him both in His death to sin and in his resurrection to new life. Perhaps as you listen to me talk about this this morning, you may be asking yourself the question, why is this important to know? Pastor Mike, why are you taking 35 minutes this morning to to bring our attention to this point simply because what is true of the red dye becomes true of the white cloth when it gets baptized into the red dye. It becomes the same as the red dye. It becomes red. In the same way, what is true of Jesus becomes true of repentant sinners who were baptized into him. Oh, we don't become divinity, no. We don't become the son of God as he is, but we do become sons of God, and we become daughters of God, and we find then that he covers us. He infuses every part of us so that his life becomes our life. His victory becomes our victory. His standing with the Father becomes our standing with the Father. And no passage of Scripture describes this better Then 2 Corinthians 5.17. Look look at it on the screen with me. Paul writes, therefore, if anyone is, say it with me, in, in Christ. In Christ. How do you get in Christ? By spirit baptism. You are baptized into him. And if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. Notice, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 
This is not just some magic wand getting waved and oh, you were guilty before but now you're not. No, this is a real, honest transformation that takes place because of the work of the Spirit of God as He baptizes us into Jesus. And as He does that, we become new people. Our old self is dealt a death blow and a brand new spirit, a brand new nature is born in our very soul. Thinking of that verse, let me ask this question. If I'm in Christ, am I still just an old sinner as we uh, are so prone to quickly say, and Satan wants us to believe? No. No, I, I'm a new creation. I've been made new by the power of the cross, baptized into Jesus, so that he covers every part of me and infuses every part of me. Well, does that mean then that I'm sinless? That I cannot sin? No, I, I can still sin. I can still sin because my entry into Jesus is spiritually based, not physically based. You see, my flesh has not been transformed yet. It was not baptized into Christ, just that inner man of who I really am. And so my flesh is unredeemed and it is fully capable of committing sin. And that's why the scripture talks about crucifying the flesh. And we're going to talk about that next week as we talk about the daily application of the cross. But for now, I simply want you to understand that the freedom that Jesus made possible by the divine sacrifice that he made through the cross is applied by the Holy Spirit as he baptizes us into Christ. And in this baptism, I am fully immersed into Christ so that he covers me, every part of me. He infuses himself through and through me. And like the cloth baptized into red dye, I take on a new nature, a new character, a new identity, that of Jesus Christ, my Savior and Lord. You say, well, Pastor Mike, well, what about water baptism? That thing that we're all so familiar with. I'm glad you asked because I want to clear that up. Water baptism is a physical symbol of the spiritual reality that has taken place in my life. Water baptism itself does not change who I am. It only gives testimony to the change that has taken place. You know, water baptism has long been understood as symbolizing a washing, a cleansing, an identification. As I said, next Sunday we'll be baptizing four to five individuals and their baptism symbolizes physically what has taken place in them spiritually. And what has taken place in them spiritually? Well, they've been washed in the blood of Jesus. They've been cleansed of sin's condemnation. They've been identified with Jesus' death for sin and his resurrection unto new life. And just so that you know, you know, Jesus told us in Matthew 28, he said that when we go and make disciples, we're to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Why do we do that? Is that just tradition? Is that something we just tack on because it's what we've always done? No. No, we baptize in the name of the Father because it is the Father who created redemption's plan. We baptize in the name of the Son because it is the Son of God who carried out redemption's plan. And we baptize in the name of the Holy Spirit because it is the Holy Spirit that activates redemption in a repentant sinner. The fullness of the Godhead is involved in the bringing about of the transformation of one who was an enemy of God and condemned under sin to becoming a child of God, living in the love and the grace and the acceptance and the mercy of God. And so we baptize people in water 
people who have professed faith in Jesus as their public testimony. They have turned from sin. They have turned from self. They are following Jesus who died for them and rose according to the glorious power of God unto new life. So this morning, we're looking at the way of the cross. The way of the cross is the way of divine sacrifice. Make no mistake about it. Our redemption from sin came at a high cost. And that cost was the very life of the eternal Son of God. But the way of the cross, for us who are being set free, is the way of union with Christ's death and union with his resurrection. It is what sets us free. As Paul says there in Romans 6 verse 7, those who have died to sin are free. And if we've been joined in the death of Jesus, then we have died to sin's power. And we can walk in the newness of life. This morning I ask you, have you turned from sin and self to believe in Jesus? Have you put the full weight of your life and your eternity in his hands, trusting in what he has provided through the cross and through the resurrection for your forgiveness and your acceptance with the Father. This morning, if you have not, I would invite you to join me in calling upon the name of the Lord and confessing your sin to him and confessing your faith, the faith that the Father is giving you in the Lord Jesus. Oh God, I thank you for this good news in Jesus Christ. I confess my sin to you. I turn from my own thoughts of righteousness to believe and to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, forgive my sin. Wash it away and cover me with the blood that you shed on the cross. Give me, I pray, the life that you made possible through your resurrection. By faith I receive your gospel. Lead me to be like you, to touch others with this good news as well. This is my prayer to you in Jesus' name. This morning, if you've called upon the Lord in faith, repenting of sin and trusting in him, I would love to be able to rejoice in that and share with you some things that I believe will be helpful to you as you begin your walk with Christ. I hope that you'll come and share that with me. I want to close this morning with this prayer, a prayer for those who believe, a prayer for those who have trusted A prayer for those who have been joined in union with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. who have been baptized into him by the Spirit. A prayer of response according to what we have seen today in the Word. Holy Father, thank you for revealing in your Word how you set us free from the power of sin and death. By faith, I confess that I have died with Christ. Sin no longer has power over me. By faith, I confess that I have been raised to new life with Christ. I stand before you clean, righteous, and holy. Because of my union with Jesus, I can live my life unto you. May your spirit remind me of this reality daily when tempted to sin may I remember that I've been set free and may I use my freedom to 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 bring glory to you and to help others find their freedom in Christ Jesus help me to grow in this understanding and in practical everyday transformation of the likeness of Jesus Christ Before we put the amen on that prayer, I just pray for you this morning. I ask that the Spirit of God, oh Father, that your Spirit would help these people and help me every day to remember what you have done. Lord, help us to remember the cloth illustration and to understand that when you baptized us into your Son by your Spirit, 
you were touching every part of us. Lord, even our bodies that our flesh that is not redeemed is redeemed in your presence in that one day that fullness will be ours as you have promised. Lord, may we not fall prey to Satan's deceptions, the darkness and the confusion he tries to bring, but may we remember that we are in Christ. Therefore, it is his life that is to be lived through us. As your apostle said, I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Lord, help us each day to live in the light of and freedom of that union in death with you and resurrection to new life. Minister to these people. Minister to our hearts. Continue your transformation in us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming out this morning. This evening we have a second Sunday prayer gathering, 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Have a great day.